Hi, good afternoon. Um, you know, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be invited to speak today on the idea of political risk and how it may affect businesses, particularly in times of uh, very political and certain um, contexts. Uh, and I'm also going to show you today some ideas about the, the Southeast Asian context and how it may apply to the context of Mongolia um, as, as one of the you know, um, more important Northeast Asian countries that you know, will, will boom in the next few years. Um, so the title of my talk is Navigating Markets Amid Political Uncertainty particularly in the time of populism. I believe that the idea or the phenomenon of populism is one of the more fundamental and important political challenges that has to be understood by anyone navigating in any markets. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of Warwick and Roger. It's a, it's a political risk consulting firm in Asia. Uh, we operate in several markets and so we, we, we have expertise in risk analysis and risk management. And we're happy to, to, to be invited here today to share some of our insights um, today, you know. Okay, so let me preface this talk by explaining to you the idea of populism. It's something that many people are trying to, in, in, in popular discourse, many people have been trying to understand and to explain, especially in the rise of Trump, especially in the context of Brexit, and in Southeast Asia, you have President Duterte, you have President Jokowi in Indonesia. And it's, it's actually a phenomenon that you also see in, in, in several European countries, in, in, uh, in, in uh, ironically, Western European countries. But only a few people understand what exactly populism is. So um, the argument I put forward today is that populism is essentially a style or strategy of rhetoric. Particularly, it's a narrative that's that's, you know, uh, uh, that creates demarcations among people, particularly a binary demarcation among people. Um, it's creating an enemy out of, of, of a particular demographic. Um, it may be the poor versus the rich. It may be Russia versus China. It may be ethnic lines, uh, across ethnic lines and, 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 other, um, and, and other contexts. But we, I want to, to focus on two emotions, two political emotions that are usually uh, embedded in the discussion or in the phenomenon of populism. And that is the, 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 the rhetoric of hate and the rhetoric of belonging. So political leaders create this scenario where you know, uh, they, they, they try to paint a picture where uh, one group will, will, will try, to, try to pit one's one group over another, and another will, will, will pick one group over another. And that creates the legitimacy for that political leader. But, you know, we have to differentiate politic, uh, populism across two spectrums. Um, and, what, and that's what, what I call maybe economic populism and political populism. Both types of populism have very important implications for businesses. If you talk about economic populism, that's something you see in Latin America. And that's something that, you know, very few, uh, but actually sub, 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 substantial amounts of uh, journalists and, and analysts have been talking about. But what I say is that it's not really something that can be found automatically with populism. It's not an automatic connection. But it is possible. So when we talk about economic populism, we're talking about protectionism through trade barriers. We're talking about economic nationalism, meaning that foreign ownership restrictions will be higher. We're also talking about tariffs and trade barriers, but also we're talking about social policy for labor. So what is the implication for business? The implication is that there is a bigger risk of nationalization for certain industries, particularly industries that are, um, that are uh, very important for a country. For Mongolia, you're talking about mining. So what, what we can see eventually in the future, is that there is a risk of nationalization. Therefore, foreigners, foreign companies will not be able to participate as easy as it was before. Uh, we're also talking about tariffs. So what are tariffs? Essentially, it's your taxes that are imposed on a particular industry in order for, that, for, for, for a foreign company to have a harder or easier time to come in a country. Okay? We're also talking about greater labor rights, protection for labor rights. 
You know, in, in Asia, um, the, 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 the economies of Asia are known for cheap labor. Because of economic populism, what happens is that cheap labor will, will not necessarily be a reality and therefore will affect foreign direct investments. So what you can see, if, if, if you can find economic populism in one context, labor rights will probably be imposed better through higher wages, right, instead of lower, and therefore that makes it less attractive for companies to come in uh, and, and, and invest in a country. Um, but also you see what we call political populism. And this is where it gets tricky because most populist leaders or most popul the, the phenomenon of populism is more closely embedded in this concept. So what are we talking about? We're talking about anti-immigration. So if, if, if w w what you can see in, in Myanmar, for example, there are Rohingya Muslims, the, the ethnic minorities are being persecuted. Um, there's a big immigration issue in Europe um, and uh, in, in the Philippines, um, you know, uh, while, while the Chinese are, are being, uh, you know, um, welcomed more. Um, some some groups don't like uh, that that particular, uh, you know, the participation of some Chinese nationals in in the Philippine economy. Uh, it may seem far fetched, but actually there's a big implication for business. One is that nationality restrictions would mo most likely be um, emboldened. What are nationality restrictions? We're we're talking about ownership of land. We're talking about ownership or participation of foreign companies uh, in the in the you know in the in the equity bifurcation. Uh, we're also talking about greater disdain, greater popular disdain for foreign businesses, and because of that, you know, we're also uh, dealing with risks of greater political instability because of more rallies. Uh, more rallies, more uh, in the literature we call that contentious politics. Essentially, you you, you can expect uh, a physical harm on business assets. You're talking about factories. You're talking about supply chain. Uh, you know all these physical assets. You're talking about roads, roadblocks, and all these things. So both types of populism actually has very deep implications for business. But we have to understand uh, what type of populism can actually take root in a country. For some countries, it may just be economic populism. For some countries, it may just be political populism. In the United States, actually, what, what we can see is just, it's just political populism. In the Philippines, it's a mix, mix between economic populism and political populism. Um, that's why you can see tax reform in the Philippines. Taxes that are imposed on business and imposed on, on, on people as well. So you have those two types of populism. What I understand from Mongolia is that it's actually both. Um, the participation of Chinese business, and probably to an extent Russian business, is being uh, 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 greatly questioned by some, some, in, uh, in some quarters in the parliament and in the more popular political scene. So this is uh, the, the, the understanding populism, understanding the political shifts in a country it's very important for business to understand, and that's, I think, the first step in order to manage the risks that can be accrued um, uh, in, in several contexts. And you know, th these contexts may not just be domestic. International contexts play a big role in, in, in the, the rise of populism or the, 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 the downfall of populism in, in the future. And therefore, what we can see are three things um, and on how populism can affect markets. The first one is that the, the type of populism has to be understood clearly. And that's something that businesses have to invest on. Trying to understand the, the nature of the enemy or the context where they operate in. Second, um, it is a mistake to think that global economic populism is on the rise. In fact, it's the total opposite. Trade deals are being made uh, every day. Uh, you, you can talk about the ASEAN context, you can talk about the ASEAN plus three context, you can talk about the Belt and Road Initiative of China, you can talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The point is, more trade openness is actually happening, as opposed to what many people think. And that's actually an opportunity, rather than a threat to, for, 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 for businesses. Um, third, we should expect this to cascade down to the social level. Uh, the difference between the difference between uh, 
populist politics before in the early 1900s and what you see now is that uh, it's less on trade but less on protecting people through 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 greater um, empowerment in, in, in the sense of giving them more leeway uh, through welfare policies. So that's in the social policy realm. So I think you really have to understand the, 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 the type of populism, why populism happened in one country and not in another, and how the global rise of populism affects the, 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 the local level. So we think that populism is a big risk, and therefore we have to talk about risks, right? So, uh, as we know, uh, this is a risk management forum. Um, what we know is that a firm cannot possibly define its objectives without knowledge and understanding and a strategy to mitigate and engage those risks. But we're talking about a particular type of risk, and that is political risk. And we have to ask, therefore, what are political risks in the first place? Uh, but at the onset, we have to understand that markets and politics are not separate. In fact, we uh, at Warwick and Roger, we believe that markets in themselves are embedded in politics. They're not just related, but we say that it's always going to be political. You talk about tax reform, you talk about economic policy, may, may it be financial incentives to companies for special economic zones. These are political decisions. And that, 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 that um, they're not separate from how leaders think, um, the popular opinions of people. And therefore, political risks are very, very important. So what are they? Political risks are any and all political events that may otherwise affect business, operations, and profitability. So there is a real financial implication with political risks. Um, if, for example, nationalization happens for mining, Obviously, if you're a foreign investor, what happens is that you have to submit and subsume all of your assets and all of your profit to the state, to the government, and you will cease to exist as a different or a, as a private entity. And if we're talking about billions of dollars of operations, you lose billions of dollars of, of, uh, of uh, you know, money for, 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 for future profits, especially with belligerent leaders. Um, and you can see this in many cases in Latin America. You can see this in the authoritarian Philippines before. Um, you, you can also see this in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and so there's so many examples uh, that, that we can put forth. Um, so what are, what are examples of political risks? We're talking about political leadership reshuffles. Why is that important? It's important because there might be an epistemic shift. That means that there might be a shift in the priorities of how leaders think. If a leader, for example, is pro-Chinese business, suddenly becomes re uh, replaced by a pro-Russia business, obviously there's a big implication. And uh, if, if you're the latter, then it, you, will, you should expect a harder time to, to uh, operate in one context. We're also talking about regime changes. We're talking about parliament towards a federal system. In the Philippines and Myanmar, actually, two, those two markets are experiencing federal shifts. Uh, in government, and that has many implications. For federalism itself, the implication is more policy complexity. What happens is that it, it's, it's, business will have a hard time uh, operating in, in, in one province or another because of the differences in policies regarding business. You also have, of course, legislative proposals and regulatory initiatives. This is the more common type of political risk that you can see. But you can also talk about labor politics if suddenly 10 million people decide to, to, to one, boycott your products, or two, um, suddenly storm your building and help hold you in hostage. It, you know, it, it actually happens. Embassies are being uh, ransacked and, and uh, burnt down, especially in very unstable governments where you operate. You can see that in several African countries. In Southeast Asian countries, you see that less often, but it still happens. Um, of course, you talk, also talk about terrorism and ethnic conflicts. Terrorism, of course, the rise of the ISIS. Um, in Southeast Asia, it's happening, particularly in, in what we, we consider the terrorism belt in southern Philippines, and in, in northern Malaysia, northern Indonesia. Um, that, that, that's an actual threat. And usually these places are, are very rich in natural resources for commodity trade, minerals, fruits, and all of these businesses. So that, obviously, terrorism poses a risk. Usually terrorists 
you know, stay in one country or stay in one context and make that their, their, uh, uh, their, their home base. And that what happens there is that all businesses will cease to exist or will simply be a transfer to the hands of the terrorists themselves. It happens to, you know, in, in Syria and, the, and in other Middle East countries where these groups are, are homegrown. Um, but it's not just in, in the, the domestic context. What you also have to understand is the geopolitical or the interstate international relations that may actually affect uh, um, businesses, uh, regional politics as well. So whatever happens in the ASEAN market for Southeast will, will affect the 10 member Southeast Asian states. So what we have now, for example, is the rise of the ASEAN economic community, uh, which is, which is except essentially removing trade barriers among uh, the, the, the 10 member states. But for, for the European Union, for example, creating a trade partnership with ASEAN, ASEAN may be more protective. So it, it means that the 10 member states may decide to increase tariffs for European goods, for American goods, for Mongolian goods, for Chinese goods, and for, for other uh, goods, because they are excluded from that regional setting. So we have to understand what happens in those meetings how leaders think, you know, and, and, and not just the, the, the domestic political context. Leaders interact with one another at the international level, and that creates knowledge and policy sharing, right? So definitely, uh, you can see what we call a diffusion of ideas of policies towards divergence or, 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 or convergence. Um, and so how do we manage these political risks? So we, we now go to political risk management. Essentially, it's, it's uh, similar to risk management practices uh, in that the steps, when we disaggregate the steps, it's, it's, uh, it's similar to, to financial risk management, economic risk management. But the, 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 what, what differentiates political risk management is the way you analyze the risk <clears throat> itself and how you identify those risks to begin with. And, there, and therefore, there are probably four steps, roughly. It depends on who you ask. But for our firm, what we practice is essentially four. You have risk monitoring. And this is a service that we actually do uh, monthly or, or, or every day. We monitor the possible risks that happen to, uh, that, 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 may, that, that, that may affect businesses or, or clients. Um, and of course, because of monitoring, you can identify the risks that, that can affect businesses. But I think the more important thing really is to is the third step, which is risk assessment and risk forecasting. And that's where political science, social science methods come, come in and come in handy. So the difference is how you analyze um, um, risks. But the very first step towards risk management is understanding that there is a risk to begin with. If you don't think that there is a risk, then you might just be surprised that one day you lose a lot of money. And therefore, the early, this risk management is an early warning device, an early warning tool for, for businesses in order for, in order for them at the executive level um, to, to be able to plan in the future, in the next five years, or you know, in the next 10 years, or maybe in the next week, what kind of decisions they should make in light of the context where the, these businesses are embedded in. And so once we identify and understand those risks, what we do is we try to mitigate those risks before they, 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 uh, they become a reality. Or if they are already a reality, we create strategies to engage those, those, uh, those risks. And you know, at, at this juncture, I want to give some case studies on how, we, we, how uh, several companies have managed those risks. And we're talking about the biggest companies in the world, very, very popular brands. I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, Coca-Cola, for example, in, in, uh, in several contexts, the rise of healthy, healthy uh, legislation, uh, pro-health legislation, anti-sugar legislation because it's cancerous, um, is 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 very much uh, is very much uh, in in play. But in the Philippine context, what we saw is the because Coca-Cola imports this uh, product, a uh, particular product they use to to make the to complete the solution of Coca-Cola, it's called high fructose corn syrup. And the political power of the sugar block, which was a traditional European uh, uh, power center in the Philippines, uh, 
uh, tried to block the importation of high fructose corn syrup because it's not actual sugar. And because it's not actual sugar, uh, and Coca-Cola Philippines rely on, on, on that, on that, uh, on that uh, product, uh, the domestic sugar industry went down because Coca-Cola is not buying sugar from the local block anymore. And therefore, because of the power of the, of the sugar block in the Philippines, the voting block, they, they, they're embedded in one very important um, island in the Philippines. Uh, and they control politics um, in some instances. Uh, Coca-Cola had to deal with that problem. And therefore, they had to argue in parliament uh, why, why it's, it's bad, you know, or, or why uh, importing HFCS is good. Um, and therefore, what happened was they engaged the, the, the way they managed the risk was to engage the parliament themselves. So we're talking about food and beverage. But on another spectrum, Facebook is a very popular um, company for politicians because it may be a tool used by their opponents to win or you know, to make them lose. Uh, but also you spread you know, what, what we call fake news in a post-truth world. Uh, that's something that governments are trying to, to combat because it might actually be against them. Um, and also, also opposition leaders who lost out in the elections are very concerned about fake news. Essentially, it's a tool that's being used for, for propaganda. You're also talking about trolls. So Facebook is actually engaging governments today um, all over the world because governments want to ban or, or, or want to, to, to take away the, the operation of uh, Facebook in several contexts. And that's really, really bad for business. So they really have to engage these people. So, so what did they do uh, in order to, to uh, you know, manage the risk? Uh, what they did was to, to create engagements and literacy programs for people who are in the political arena. Um, or or not, not really in the political arena, but but for, 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 for the general public, in order to you know, improve their image, um, especially in, in, in the time of uh, uh, you know, uh, very rich democratic traditions in several countries. Um, but we can also talk about technology firms. Facebook is, is a social media firm. Uh, Qualcomm, which actually is a very highly publicized um, you know, risk that happened to, to Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm is the producer of chips, and it, they're, they're essentially in the semiconductor industry. Chips that are being used for several phones, like Apple, uh, like uh, like Nokia, you know, Bloom, uh, you know the, and, and some Huawei maybe, um, and the they faced they faced several several um, problems with patent rights, because for example in the Philippines. The production of chips is very is a big industry, and what they face is that you know Qualcomm is trying to copy all of those um, um, uh, uh, the the design the industrial design for those chips, and actually that's something that they faced in China, and South Korea, in the United States, maybe in Europe. So they're trying to mitigate those risks in other markets where they operate. Um, in Southeast Asia, um, technology export is becoming a very big export product in Thailand, you know, in the Philippines, and, um, as well as Indonesia, next to textile. Uh, but we're also talking about Visa and MasterCard. They're trying to adapt their business to, to financial inclusion um, uh, because governments want to engage the, what they call the unbanked people in order to, to, to improve their access to finance. Uh, and Visa and MasterCard are trying to, to you know, adapt to that kind of to that kind of policy priority, or program priority of governments, and this direction may come from the central bank, from the ministries of finance, uh, and because be, the, the risk really is if they don't adapt to these programs, then they may you know lose out to to, to several to several uh, local or other international uh, you know financial uh, firms, and uh, you know in, in this space. So these are examples of political risks that big, big companies face. But in, in some industries, like mining is a very important industry, especially for Mongolia. Um, in several instances, you know, in the Philippines, there's a legislation to ban uh, 
the export of minerals unless they're, they're processed first in the Philippines. So there's an existing legislation that uh, several big companies try to, 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 you know, to, to fight. Um, and they, and then, you know, because that will pose a big risk for them. The profit margins will go down if they have to process it first because that requires creating a processing plant in, in, in the local arena. And that's probably something that Rio Tinto is also trying to face or, or, or trying to understand or actually already facing in some other contexts. Uh, you know, we can talk about other industries, energy, telecommunications, uh, but these are examples of why companies should be able to understand political risks uh, that may be that they may face, and it's becoming more acute because of the phenomenon of of, of national of because of the phenomenon of political populism as well as of economic populism. So at this juncture, I, I I'd, uh, I'd be happy to to take some of your points and questions, and maybe to 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 to, to discuss. Um, the you know other other stuff that you may have in mind. Thank you.